Well, if you haven't heard, we are starting a new sermon series that I am truly, uh, personally, excited to dig into. Uh, we're going to start on the book of Esther. If you've not opened your Bibles already, would invite you to grab a Bible, open up the book of Esther. Esther comes right behind the book of Nehemiah there. And uh, before you get to your Psalms, it's in the Old Testament. It's on page 517 of my Bible. I don't know about yours. But uh, I'm going to be an Esther exclusively today. And uh, we're going to be an Esther pretty exclusively for the, the most of the remainder of this year. We're going to look at Esther in depth. And uh, this, this has kind of been an intentional thing by me. Uh, we have a bunch of overlapping things that have been going on here as far as what we've been teaching at Gloria Baptist Church. We had Daniel this summer as our VBS theme. And I love the book of Daniel, and I really wanted to preach Daniel. But uh, I, I wasn't going to steal that from VBS. So VBS got Daniel. And I, I went through Haggai earlier this year, which is overlapping. Um, I've been talking through some of Nehemiah with the students on Wednesday evening the last two weeks at our Kidman program. And now we are starting this journey into Esther. And Esther is a, a fabulous, wonderful book. Beautiful literature, great story. And hopefully, hopefully it'll be edifying to you and it'll excite you and would invite you. I think this series is going to be fantastic. This is a, if you have friends who don't go to church, invite them to come be part of this because I think uh, they will be blessed by this series. And I, I've titled the series Esther, God's Perfect Work Through Imperfect People. Something I think all of us can relate to, right? Uh, God works in amazing ways through all of us as imperfect people. And as we begin our study of this book of Esther, I want to give you a, a bit of background and history on it. Uh, the book of Esther was one of the last books of the Old Testament that was written. Now, it was written about two and a half thousand years ago, so we're still talking about a, a pretty ancient book by all accounts. But it is newer than almost all of the rest of the Old Testament. We don't specifically know who the author was. Uh, there's no internal evidence. Some Bibles will say, or some Bibles, some, some books of the Bible will say, so-and-so wrote this, or I, John, writing to you, Paul, and it gives us some clues. But we don't get that from the book of Esther. Uh, we know the Holy Spirit, of course, worked through and, 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 and ensured that God wrote what he wanted there. But uh, the likelihood is it may have been written by one of the characters, a man by the name of Mordecai, who we'll get to, in a, uh, not tonight, not today, but eventually we'll get to. Um, but uh, an interesting, interesting book, no matter how we, how we look at it. So we'd invite you, as you're able, uh, if you've got a Bible, open up to Esther 1.1. Uh, you can look on your iPhones, your iPads. We've got Bibles in the Welcome Center. If you don't own one, take one. And there's a few of them in the pews as well. And Esther 1.1 is where we're going to be spending... Um, all of our time actually today. And I'm going to go through it in a similar fashion. If you were here for our studies on Ruth as we went through Ruth or, or Jonah, um, two series that were incredibly popular, uh, we're going to go through it in a somewhat similar fashion. And, and as we walk through this, uh, not exactly verse by verse, but pretty close, we do this uh, because all scripture is God breathed and profitable. And, and that includes the book of Esther. And so that's why we're going to dig into this. Now, as we, as we look at Esther 1 1, if you're looking at that, who, who is the very first character that God introduces in this epic story? Well, we read in Esther 1.1, 1, 1, it says, Now, in the days of, this is an interesting name, Ahasuerus, right? Now, let me unpack that a little bit. This guy named Ahasuerus. That's his Persian name. But the name that more people in the world would actually know him by is his Greek name. His Greek name was Xerxes. Anybody ever heard of Xerxes before? Yeah, he, he's more well-known worldwide in his Greek name than he is in his Persian name. And now, now Xerxes, as I'm going to call him more often than not, because it's easier to say that than Ahasuerus, uh, there's a lot less syllables to Xerxes, right? And Xerxes sounds kind of more manly, too. I like Xerxes. It's a, if I had a dog, I might name him Xerxes. It's a good, you know, good name. But now Xerxes here was this, this great Persian king, and he ruled and reigned over an incredible time. And, and he towers... In, in human history and in time and, and towers over the life and the story of Esther. Now at the point of the story of Esther, he's in his mid-30s. And uh, we're going to read in just a little moment that he's in the, the third year of his reign. He's assumed the throne at roughly 32 years of age, we know from history. So, so at the point of the story, he's something like 35 or 36 years old. And the interesting part, and the only reason I mention that is, is because that means when Esther enters the scene into the story, 
She's like 15 or 20 years younger than he is. So it's just kind of an interesting note in, in the story. And, and Xerxes grew up as a, as a man who was incredibly wealthy, very affluent. And, and he's commented at length by, commented upon at length by a man by the name of Herodotus. If you don't know who that is, if you, if you were to go to his wiki page, wiki, or look online, um, he, Herodotus was kind of the very first historian of the world who, who wrote in a particular fashion. You see, up until the time of Herodotus, when you wrote history, it was the victors who wrote the history. So, so if your team won, you got to write history. And that, that kind of shades history with a particular slant. When Herodotus comes along, he tries to write from an impartial view. He doesn't try to write, yeah, our team won, right? He, he tries to show both sides of things. And that was, he was the first to really do that. And so that's kind of his acclaim. And he did it at this time. And he wrote extensively about King Xerxes and the Persians. And so we actually have quite a bit of history about this guy that we can read about, much more so than many times we have about other people who are in the Bible. And so some of what I'm going to share with you over the, the weeks to come comes directly uh, from this historian. Uh, he was a Greek historian, and he's kind of referred to as the godfather of historians. And he piloted this idea, like I said, of this impartial telling. And, and so where does this bring us? Where does this start off with? Where does the story of Esther take place? And if you look again back at Esther 1.1, it says, this is Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 different provinces or satraps. The thing you need to know about him, about Xerxes, is he is without question the most powerful man on the earth at this time. And truly among the most powerful men in the history of all of the world. There's no one in this day and age and time that, that ruled as Xerxes ruled. His father was a man by the name of Darius. Uh, Darius was a legendary king. He ruled something like 36 years. And, and Darius was a man who, who had gone and greatly expanded the Persian Empire. He had taken over all sorts of other countries, conquered them, assimilated them, brought multiple nations under his care and watch. And so the kingdom that... that is inherited by Xerxes is a kingdom that spans many different nations, many different peoples, lots of different races, different ethnicities, different languages, and, and different religious convictions as well. And Darius, and, and even perhaps Xerxes, if they had been religious at all, probably would have been Zoroastrians, and so they were pagans. They weren't believers of the God of the Bible. Um, and it says that at this point in the story, they live in a town by the name of Susa. And if you want a modern day place to imagine where Susa would be located, um, that would be modern Iran. Okay, so we're in the Middle East, they're in Iran, uh, quite a distance away from Jerusalem, quite a distance away from the temple, away from the priesthood, away from the, the physical presence of God. And, and if you don't know your Old Testament background, what had happened was, as often happens, the Jews were disobedient. They, they did not remain true to the one true God. They fell into idolatry. God brings the Babylonians in as the hammer of justice. And, and what it happens is they are taken into Babylonian captivity. So we've talked about some of this in the past. So the Jews basically are, are captured, made slaves, taken away 700 miles from their home in Jerusalem and forced to work. Well, as happens over time, when one country conquers another, the Babylonians are knocked off by the Persians. Okay. Well, the Babylonians kept the Jews as slaves. The Persians come in, and, and they're far more generous and far more religiously liberal. And they, they look around and go, well, we really don't need you all here. Why are you all here? Why don't, yeah, go back home, you know. So, so a whole big segment of Jews do go back to Jerusalem. As we looked at Haggai, and if you look at Nehemiah, you'll see some of that. And some of the other Ezra, you'll see some of that in, in the Old Testament. But there were some that kind of said, you know, we're doing pretty good here. I think we'll stick around here. We're not going home. We're not going back to Jerusalem. Which, which, on their part, historically speaking and biblically speaking, was a mistake. They were supposed to go back. They were God's chosen people and they were supposed to live in Israel. But they liked it where they were, so they stayed. And that kind of explains why they are still living in this area when we get to this time of King Xerxes. And so, so Darius had expanded this enormous empire and then he, he turns the keys over to his son. And, and, and in the way it worked back in those days and ages is 
If you were a king, you were effectively thought of like you were a god. You were a godlike person. And you could pretty much do most anything you wanted. There was no checks and balances. You were king and everybody jumped and you said jump. And if they didn't, off with their heads. That's how life worked if you were king. It was a good job to have if you could get it, right? Uh, the, the drawback was somebody was always trying to kill you. So there was a little give and take there, whether that was a desirable job or not. But uh, Xerxes particularly... Um, these, these kings would have multiple wives. Uh, this, this tradition, they practiced polygamy. Uh, and in that tradition, uh, women were widely mistreated. And in addition to that, beyond having multiple wives, he had a, a very large harem uh, that, that would be just a whole wing of his palace and uh, where he would keep these women whose job was just to keep the king happy, whatever his desires were. And so, so this starts with Darius, and, uh, who was actually a very good king. And then uh, he has multiple wives, Darius does, and has lots of children, because one of the things that they believed in that day and age was the more wives and the bigger harem and the more children you had, the, 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 the greater you were perceived as a man and as a king in the kingdom. But as Darius was reaching the end of his reign, he, he, he reached a point where he had to make a decision. He had lots of wives, he had lots of sons, which one is going to take over? Well, he somehow chooses Xerxes. He, he, he turns it all, this grand kingdom he had created, gives the keys to Xerxes and says, here you go. But why did he choose Xerxes? We don't know. But what we do know is, is Xerxes really not a good guy. Right? History tells us he was a narcissistic, spoiled, rich kid. Grew up in a palace never worked a day in his life, never had to go to war, never had to fight, never had to labor, never had to struggle. He grew up incredibly spoiled. He never lacked anything, and he was literally handed a kingdom by his father that he was able to go and take and rule and do with as he pleased. A rough life if you can get it, right? Yeah, you can inherit the kingdom. I mean, hey, more power to you. Now, because the nations have changed in time, let me give you an idea of the size and scope, uh, magnitude of this nation. The, you can see in the picture that Ruth's put up here, uh, he basically ruled from Sudan all the way up into modern day Pakistan, right? And then if you kind of go across the Mediterranean all the way over into Greece, this is a huge swath of the world. And, and imagine that today. I mean, imagine that region today. Pakistan and India and Iran and Iraq and Egypt and and Morocco, and Greece, and Turkey, and all those, all those different countries. Imagine that. Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, all of that inside of this picture. Imagine all of those countries together united today as one nation, right? Can you imagine that? That, that would be absolutely amazing, wouldn't it? I mean, honestly, if we could even get two of those nations to get along with one another, it would be pretty amazing. I mean, there's just there's constant conflict there, and there's been constant conflict there for thousands and thousands of years, and yet Xerxes and Darius were able to come in and kind of coalesce these nations together into some sort of working, functioning, vast empire. And, and at this point in the history of the world, there had never been uh, an empire this large, this vast, this affluent, this powerful. And so it's hard to overstate who this guy Xerxes was. And the city of Susa itself historically is believed to be the largest concentration of wealth in the world at any one point at any given time. There was so much money and wealth that poured into Susa there during this time that it, it, it was rich beyond imagination, right? And so really an interesting and unique place and time. When did this all happen? Well, it says in verse 2, In those days when King Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, sat on the royal throne in, in Susa, um, in the citadel in the third year of his reign, as I mentioned before. And, and an interesting side note is, he's got this giant palace that he lives in, but he was so rich and so affluent, he had a second pal palace built um, in case, for whatever reason, the floors were being done that day, or I don't know, whatever. I mean, the guy had two palaces. He had a backup palace, right? And that's rich. I mean, it's one thing to have two houses, but to have two palaces, that, that's pretty crazy. And in addition, we're told from history that, that Xerxes was a really handsome guy. Now, I don't know exactly what a handsome guy back in that age was, but you know, tall, dark, and handsome, I imagine. 
Uh, but I, I would disagree if that's handsome. I tend to think of pasty, a little overweight, with a bad knee. That's handsome, right? <laughs> Ladies? Come on. No? All right. But whatever your picture of handsome is, the, 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 the history, Herodotus tells us that, that Xerxes was perceived to be a, a very handsome man for his time. A good-looking guy. So he's got wealth. He's got power. He's got looks. It's, this guy has it all, right? And then we're told about his throne. Um, for whatever reason, it's more a man thing, I think. Sometimes as men, we, we have things that we like to own. For some guys, it's a car, right? And that car is like a representation of who we are. For some guys, it's their bass boat. Some guys, it's how they take care of their lawn. If my lawn doesn't look right, then I don't look right, right? Some, some guys, you know, just all kinds of things like that. And for King Xerxes, it was his throne. Let me tell you about his throne. His throne symbolized everything that he valued. The throne, we're told, is beautiful. And it's enormous. It was glorious. Uh, the, the picture of him seated on it is of him as seated whenever he was there, whenever he was seated on his throne, no matter where he was and where that throne was, that throne was put way higher than anybody around him. So no matter where he was, he was looking down upon you. Okay? He was, he was high. He was exalted. He was meant to be glorious and, and, and to really look godlike. Right? Um, and and this, this throne is to show him in all of his majesty and all of his glory. And it, it was meant to show him as ruling and reigning as if he were truly a god. And, and when he would go off in battle, he, would have, he had a special team. They were like his own special forces. Uh, a group called the Immortals. And they were these special fighting operatives that he had that would surround him. And they would literally carry this giant monstrosity of a throne, wherever the battles were, they would find the highest hill and they would take that hill as his special forces. And they would go up on that hill and they'd build a platform and they'd put him up on top of it so he could see and everybody could see him. And know, oh yeah, he must be better than us because he's up top. Remember how playing king of the hill was when you were a kid? Yeah, this guy is uh, playing king of the hill at a kingly level. And so um, that's, that's what this guy was about. He would always sit at the highest point. He would always make himself visible. And he loved to sit there and watch his foes get defeated. And part of the story of this throne was, if you or anybody else were to go and sit on the throne, or even touch the throne, immediate death. That was the law. And not only that, there was a special rug that they would lay out before they would put the throne down. If you touched that rug, immediate death. They would kill you. Didn't matter who you were. Didn't matter why you touched it. Death. Only these immortals, these special forces guys that he had, were allowed to touch these things as they would move them. And that was it. Nobody else could touch it. And so the other part of it was, even if he wasn't in the room and you were walking by the throne, say you were in there that day and you were sweeping the floors, you were required to bow down before that throne, even if it was empty. This is how big his ego was. You had to bow down, you had to worship, you had, you had to, in, in adoration, even though he wasn't there, to the great King Xerxes, this king of kings, right? He thought he was a god. And he was effectively worshipped as if he was a god. So he's got all this wealth, power, influence, might. What's he do with it, right? What's he going to do with all of this money? What's he going to do with all this power? What's he going to do with all of his fame? Is he going to take care of all the widows and orphans and those in need? Is he going to look after young girls who might have been abused in that day? Is he going to look for kids who, who needed a hand up or kids who might not have had a dad and mentor them? No, of course not. He's not going to do that. Here's what he does. Look at verse 3. It says, He gave a feast for all of his officials and servants. The army of the Persian of Persia and, and Media... And the nobles and the governors of the province were before him. So he brought in all of his military leaders. He brought in all of the big higher level government leaders and brought them in for a party. What's the biggest party you've ever been to? Was, was it a, maybe a wedding dance, you know, a wedding reception kind of party? Maybe, maybe you were at a big party for somebody's 50th anniversary. Maybe it was a high school 25th anniversary or something, right? This party, though, was the party... To end all parties. 
The commentators say just his military generals and his leaders and his rulers were over 15,000 people. 15,000 people. Food, drinks, flowers everywhere, we're told. Place settings for everybody. Entertainment day and night. Do you need a ticket to get in? Nope. It's all free. It's all from this great king, Xerxes. How long did this party last? This is where it gets really crazy. Look at verse 4. It says, While he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor of his pomp and his greatness for many days. How many days? 180 days. At least 15,000 people partying for half a year straight. All of the political leaders, all of the military leaders. And they're all like, we're going to go to Susa and we're going to get knockout drunk for six straight months. It's effectively what they did. So you know from history, if they can get away with this, that the country is, or the, the, the empire is running pretty well. Could you imagine if, well, our, our country might run better if all the leaders left for six <laughs> months, but nonetheless, uh, that's neither here nor there. But, but if you've got a country like this and all your military leaders and all your political leaders effectively leave their stations, they can only do this at a time of great peace. You've vanquished all of your enemies. You've suppressed all the insurrection. You have shown your wealth and your might, and there's nobody left to resist or rebel. And so this man has power, and he's putting on this party to show off, right? And not only does he do this, and he does this because he loves people, right? right? No, that's not why he does it. He, doesn't, he does this because he's generous, right? No. He doesn't do it for either reason. He does it to show off. Verse 4 says, He showed the riches of his royal glory. Right? Uh, glory is a worship word. That's, a, that's our church name. That's our community name. Glo glory should be reserved for worship. And he wants to show off his glory. He's saying, everybody come and look at me. Everybody come and see me and what I have. Everybody come and check me out. For six months I want you to come and party, but I'm going to be up here on this throne looking down at you just to remind you of how much better I am than you are. It's all about His glory. Now we as Christians, of course, we believe that kind of glory is reserved for another kind of king, right? A king who seats himself on a throne. A king who rules and reigns over the nation. The king of kings. That's the kind of king that that kind of adoration and worship should be reserved for. But here is Xerxes, exalting himself, trying to make himself glorious. A mere man acting like God. The story continues in verse 5. And when those days were completed, the six months of partying, that is, and when those days were completed, the king gave for all of the people present in Susa, the citadel, both great and small, a feast lasting seven days in the courts of the gardens, king, the gardens of the king's palace. So after six months of wild and lavish partying with 15,000 of his best friends, he throws another party, right? And for seven days invites everybody. Come on in. Come in into my gardens. You regular folks, right? So people like me, I'd finally get to go. Come on in. Come on in. All you normal citizens, come on in. All you peasants, we'll give you seven days. 180 to the important people. Seven to you low work folks, right? Regular folks, the poor people. I mean, as I, as I think about this, in my imagination at least, I, I, visually I think of like basically Woodstock with all the really good bands. That's what I imagine this looked like, right? Um, just, just pandemonium and chaos. Can you imagine an entire town? And we're talking hundreds of thousands of people probably. Can you imagine an entire town shutting down and going to party? It would have been nuts. Now in verse 6, we're told some more about kind of who Xerxes was through some of the things that he decorates with. Verse 6 tells us about some of the colors in the palace. They used purple wherever they could. And the reason that it tells us that Xerxes used purple 
was because purple was the most expensive dye back in this day and age. It was very difficult to create, very difficult to acquire. Only the rich people had it. If, if you know something about the garb that the priests would wear in Jerusalem, they might have a little bit of their tassels on the very fringe of their robe, might have a little bit of purple on it to signify that they were a, a big uppity up in the church. But they would only still have a tiny, tiny little bit. And here Xerxes has got like drapes and carpets. And I mean, he he's, has, has the washcloths and the bathrooms are made purple. And I mean, just, you know, you got napkins that you're disposing of after the meal. They're purple. Anything, I mean, there's purple all over the place. And then the rest of verses 6 and 7, if you want to read those at home, reinforce just the opulence of the palace that he lived in. It says the curtain rods, you know, above the windows, they were made of solid silver. Right? Can you imagine that? And then they had couches that were literally made of gold. Uh, an entire couch. And there was fancy stones everywhere, we're told. And verse 8, verse 8 comes in and it reminds us that there's this ridiculous party going on with all of, within all of this splendor. And the only rules of the time of these parties was, go and drink and do as you please. The wine cellar of the king was open to everyone. Now back in those days and ages, it was customary for the husbands and wives to dine together, but for whatever reason, not here in this story. And so we read then in verse 9, it says that Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women in the palace, those that belonged to King Ahasuerus. So while all the men and all the rest of the town are over here drinking in one wing, we got all these ladies having a feast and a party over in another wing. And, and these are just all the women that, that he owned as king. Um, and this was a day and age where you owned people. And, and we'll get more into that as we dig in further in the story of Esther. So we have Queen Vashti over in this other wing. She's having a party. But you may not know this about her if you've never studied this before. Does anybody know who she was? Before she became queen, she was his brother's wife. He saw her, he wanted her, he took her. Not only did he take her, he said, you got an awfully good looking daughter, I'm taking her too. And made them both his, took him from his brother. So again, the character of this guy is not good. And he marries both his mother and daughter, his sister-in-law and his niece. And then beyond that, he's got a huge harem. Herodotus, this great historian I mentioned earlier, says that the last 15 years of his life, he basically paid no attention to matters of the state because he was so consumed with the women in his life. So clearly he didn't have his priorities in order. So my question to you as we go through all this, and I've given you a lot of background today, think about for a moment, as we've read through these words from the book of Esther, have you noticed anything's been missing? What's missing out of this story? Or let me ask another way, who's missing out of the story? We just read the first nine verses of this great literary book of Esther, and not once is God mentioned. God doesn't appear. And you might say, well, pastor, what if I, what if I read the rest of this book? Huh. You can go ahead and read the whole book of Esther. Not once is God mentioned. It's unique in the Bible. The only Bible story that God has never mentioned once. It's, so to speak, a godless book. God's never mentioned once. God doesn't speak. God doesn't send His prophets to speak on His behalf. No angels show up. The heavens don't open. God doesn't deliver a word personally. There's, there's no miracles in this story. There's nothing at all supernatural. So why are we studying it then, Pastor? I mean, where, where's God in the story of Esther? Well, as you study the book of Esther, I think you will see that God is rather than overtly and obvious, He's silhouetted. You know what a silhouette is, right? Have you ever seen a silhouette? Like, like many paintings you see, they're painted in, 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 in great and magnificent detail. You know, you look at Monet or Rembrandt or any of those guys, but a silhouette, on the other hand, you see it through what's not there. You see in the absence. And so as we read this story, it's like finding God in the shadows. And when you, when you look at it, you, you can't always see it right away, right? Like, like, if I just look at the words on the page, I might not see God. 
But then if I keep looking and I keep reading, all of a sudden you see God working in and through from beginning to end in this story. All of a sudden, in the absence, the presence of God becomes readily apparent. And so I would invite you, read this story with us as we go through it. Don't miss it because there is some tremendous things in this story. I want to wrap this up today with equating a couple of kings. So we have Xerxes as an example of a king. And Xerxes, while he ruled and reigned over a great many, many lands and had all kinds of wealth and riches and power and authority, he wasn't a good king. And we do worship the good king. The good news is that above Xerxes there is another king. This is not the only book of the Bible, of course, and it's part of the story that leads us to to worship a greater king. Above Xerxes' throne, there is another throne. And seated seated on it is, is a king by the name of Jesus. And we as Christians believe Jesus is our king. And that unlike Xerxes, that Jesus got down off of his throne. Jesus didn't just invite us to come and sit around him and worship him at that throne, although we we certainly can do that. But Jesus got down off of that throne and came down among the common people, came to earth, walked among us, clothed in flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. And so first I want you to hear today, and I need you to know that Jesus is a better king. Xerxes was the son of Darius, But Jesus was the Son of God. Xerxes never tasted poverty nor humility, but Jesus tasted both poverty and humility and could identify with us. Xerxes, you see, he spent his entire life being served. But Jesus, he spent his entire life serving others. Xerxes, he killed his enemy with an army of millions. Jesus... He died for his enemies, saving a billion. See, Xerxes, he sat on this throne in Susa, but Jesus sits on a throne in heaven. Xerxes was the most powerful man on earth in his time, but Jesus is the one who created that earth and created time. Xerxes declared himself to be the greatest king of all kings. But Xerxes died. He stood before and was judged by the one and only King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. We folks are citizens of a greater kingdom. We have received a greater gift. And we are looking forward to a greater blessing. And as we gather and study this together, we gather in the name of the one true King. He is the King of Kings. And that is why we celebrate Jesus Christ. And if we're willing to throw lavish and extravagant and fun and joyful parties for ungodly things, for false kings, for our own selfish joy, then how much more should we rejoice and be glad that our king knows us, that our king loves us, that our king saves us, that our king seeks us, that our king serves us, and that our king is preparing an eternal banquet for each and every one of us. Folks, Jesus is greater. And whatever you hear throughout this story, keep that in mind. Our God is for you. Our God loves you. And He is greater. This is the beginning, I think, of a great adventure through the book of Esther. Come back next week to hear some more and bring some friends with you. Let's pray.